This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hi, welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Laura Lotka, and I'm here with my co-host, Renee Williams. Today in studio, we have Dr. John Cox. Dr. Cox is an assistant professor of wildlife and conservation biology in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky. It's a pleasure to have you in studio today. Um, both you and your graduate students do research on several interesting topics. They range from uh, studying martial eagles in Kenya to river otters in New Mexico to pit vipers in central Appalachia to breeding birds in mixed metasophytic forests. Um, but today we're going to focus on your research on black bears. Um, and before we get started and talk about your work with black bears, tell us a little bit about your background, what you do at UK. So I went to college uh, and got a bachelor's and master's degree in in biology at Morehead State University. And I briefly flirted with further studies in molecular physiology and medicine and before really losing the white lab coat and turning to wildlife studies where I later graduated with a doctorate in animal science from UK. And across about 20 years here at UK, I've been a grad student, a staff member, a manager of a university farm, and now a, a faculty member here at the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. So what first got you interested in wildlife? Well, I grew up on the outskirts of a small town in Carter County, uh, located in eastern Kentucky called Olive Hill. And there's a lot of woods and creeks in that area, and my grandparents both worked at uh, nearby Carter Caves, where I spent a lot of time immersed in that natural learning environment. And uh, my dad and uncle were also into outdoor pursuits like hunting and fishing, and I'd say when I was pretty young, I became interested in science and particularly wildlife conservation. Um, and really reading and watching programs about the declining uh, situation of species and the loss of their habitats ultimately, I guess, moved me to want to do something with my life that would help solve some of these issues. And I wasn't sure if it would be through science because I also had a lot of interest in medicine and human health, but because these are ultimately linked really in various ways uh, through our broader ecological connections, I've found ways in my research and teaching to blend these uh, interests together. Great. Well, thank you for giving us some information on your background. So now we're going to kind of turn towards your research on black bears. How did you get started with that research? Well, my interest in black bear research was, uh, I guess, initially sparked by my graduate advisor, Dr. Dave Mayer, uh, who initiated bear projects in Kentucky and Florida in the early 2000s. And these were really groundbreaking studies on small population of bears in areas where they really hadn't been studied. And in the case of Kentucky, where bears had just returned and largely uh, not been looked at. So early on, I was Dave's research scientist, and we all spent time out doing bear field work in those two states. But uh, when he died while monitoring bears in Florida, um, I assumed responsibility for those bear projects. And fortunately, uh, we were able to continue that work for many more years. And we ultimately published uh, about a decade's worth of field work that we have and continue to work on. Um, a lot of grad students really cut their teeth on those bear projects, and a lot of them went on to acquire good positions in wildlife agencies, including uh, coordinating many of the bear programs uh, here in the U.S. So can you tell us about the different aspects of your research? Sure. Um, although we're really no longer doing any active bear field work, uh, we're still analyzing data and we're still publishing findings. But our work primarily focused on two types of field methods. The first being invasive capture, and that means essentially getting our hands on captured bears and putting, uh, let's say, radio collars on the adults. And the second type is non-invasive methods, which are, are increasingly popular, um, and that essentially uses DNA left behind from individual bears to answer some research questions. So with live captures, we primarily use foot snares and culvert traps uh, to hold, sedate, and then radio collar adult bears. We also uh, ear tag them and give them a lip tattoo as an individual ID in case the collar falls off and we pull hair for genetic samples. Uh, we also inject a small, what we call a pit tag, under their skin so that you can 
detect them if you recapture them in the future. And then you can read that with a recording device. It's kind of like a scanning a grocery item. Okay, so there's some several different goals that we had. And the first is learning about what we call the spatial ecology of bears. And that really deals with things like how large is their home range? What does their movement patterns look like? For example, where do bears cross roads, which might be important for the Department of Transportation and let's say putting bear crossing signs up. Um, do they cross structures, let's say like the Cumberland Gap Tunnel Bridge? Uh, also, the, are bears spending time in residential areas causing problems? Uh, a second component is looking at what we call resource use. So what kind of habitat do bears spend most of their time in? which happens to be forest, by the way. What are their food habits? Uh, what do bears eat and when? And, and we do that by collecting their scats or droppings, and we dig through those and find different parts of plants and animals. A third component is what we call winter den work. And this is interesting because we get to go in during the winter and we get to sedate the female bear and then we, we pull out her cubs, we count the number of cubs, determine whether they're males or females, you know, whether we're getting healthy reproduction from that females. And then finally, um, we do what's called population estimation, which is pretty important for management. And we primarily do that through non-invasive methods. So uh, with this non-invasive method, essentially what we do is we, we take a small stand of trees and we surround it by barbed wire and we place something like donuts or sardine cans inside of that barbed wire set and we try to lure the bears inside of that so that when they cross the barbed wire, they have their hair pulled off. We can then take that hair and we can get DNA from that. We can analyze it to tell us, for example, whether the bear was male or female. We can estimate how many bears were in a given area and then we can also estimate how related they are. And what we know is that once populations of particularly large mammals get down to very small sizes, you start to worry about inbreeding which can harm populations and help lead to their extinction. So these are pretty important things to, uh, to understand when you're dealing with small population sizes like we have in Kentucky. Okay, so you talked about kind of the three research areas that you're looking at, um, where the bears are, what they eat, and their population estimates. Can you tell us where they are in Kentucky and um, where people might be seeing them? So uh, the bears primarily occur in southeastern Kentucky so we have a core population of bears that occur along the Pine and Black Mountain regions uh, and in surrounding counties from that. And there's also a population in, in the Big South Fork down in McCreary and uh, Whitley counties. There are bears outside of those areas, but most of those bears are probably going to be uh, males, although there have been some females that have been seen in those areas. Okay. And um, what do they normally eat? Well, it's probably easier to list the things that a bear will not eat yeah. <laughs> than it is to list all the things that a bear will eat. So uh, bears are, even though they're, they are carnivores technically, they, they primarily feed on plant material. Uh, for example, a lot of what we call soft mass or berries and fruits like persimmon in the fall. Um, and in places like Florida, black bears eat a lot of ants and, and other insects. And what are what would you say are the population estimates here in Kentucky? Do you know? Yeah, so we did uh, uh, the non-invasive hair snare work that we did uh, for three years down in Cumberland and Pine Mountain areas. We estimate around three or four hundred bears in that area, and around fifty or sixty bears in the Big South Fork area. And those numbers have probably ticked up somewhat. Uh, since then, and the estimate would probably be around 500 to 750 bears statewide. Okay. Okay, so what are you finding so far with your research? Well, bears are largely forest-dwelling carnivores, um, but despite that name, carnivore, they primarily spend most of their time eating plants and insects, um, like ants, and plants like persimmon, uh, berries, things like that. I mean, they're really extremely adaptable and they can occupy most of the forested lands in Kentucky if they're allowed to, to grow and spread. Uh, the males in particular can move long distances. I mean, hundreds of miles we're talking about here uh, and across multiple states as, as we've monitored. And uh, the males are primarily looking for mates and they tend to be the young males that are out there far away from what we call the core population. 
Uh, young females, on the other hand, tend to establish territories adjacent to or, or even overlap with their mothers. Um, and this is why when bears start moving into an area, the first ones you encounter tend to be young males way out on the leading edge of what we call the colonization front. And they're out there looking for mates. While they're reproducing females, they more ex slowly um, expand their range, which can take decades given that they only have a litter of cubs about every couple of years. And that only starts at, at around age four or, or five. So we've done estimates of bear populations in Cumberland Gap, uh, Pine and Black Mountain areas uh, in the Big South Fork. And while their numbers are, are slowly increasing, uh, statewide they probably number between 500 and 750. Uh, bears have been hunted in Kentucky since 2009, and our research findings here has really helped guide the state wildlife agency in, in setting their harvest numbers uh, and also where they hunt to try and ensure the population isn't overhunted. Uh, we've also seen healthy numbers of cubs produced over the years uh, with the mothers averaging around uh, two and a half cubs per litter. And we find that bears typically are denning in trees, uh, rock crevices, brush piles are in open forest cuts, uh, and even under people's porches, uh, and, and even under old pieces of machinery. Hmm, that's interesting. I didn't know they had that many hiding places or <laughs> habitats. Um, so thanks for telling us about your research. And, you know, in addition to the, the research that you do, I know that you have a strong teaching component in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. For the students that may be listening to our show, can you tell us a little bit about the undergraduate courses that you teach? Yes. Uh, so I teach uh, the Forestry 101 course, which is the Introduction to Wildlife Conservation. And essentially that is a, a starter course for students that are interested in that field. Um, I also co-teach a junior level wildlife assessment course, which challenges our, our forestry undergrad students to, to really link forest habitat management uh, and wildlife occurrence. Uh, you know, forest landowners have a diverse set of goals when they're managing their land, and wildlife is often a big part of that plan. So basically, what species are the winners and losers when you do certain types of forest management? Um, my upper level conservation biology course is more globally focused on the pressing uh, conservation challenges for maintaining the Earth's many species. Um, that provide us really with a lot of ecological benefits and which en enriches human life. Um, I also teach a few specialty graduate seminars on wild dogs, cats, songbirds, and a travel-based uh, U.S. Biodiversity Hotspots graduate course that goes to places like uh, Yellowstone National Park and other protected lands uh, here in the U.S. Great, that's, that's a great list of courses and I know the um FOR 435, your conservation and biology course, that's one of the UK core courses for um, global dynamics. So, you know, for students that are out there that might be interested in filling that requirement, that's a good, um, a good course to, to use. Um, another thing is that we now have a new wildlife biology and management minor in our department. Can you tell us a little bit about why that minor is important and who might benefit by taking that minor? Yeah, so... Uh, over the, the nearly 20 years that I've been here, we've really had a lot of interest from students uh, in wildlife studies, but uh, many of our related programs didn't provide enough uh, course offerings that really satisfied their interest or career pursuits. So a few years ago, we decided to uh, fill this programming need by creating uh, and offering a number of wildlife courses that undergrad students could pursue to obtain a wildlife minor. Uh, we also offer a curricular path through our forestry and natural resource environmental science programs that allow students to fulfill the curricular requirements of what we call the Wildlife Society's uh, Professional Certification Standards. And uh, those standards are required of, of some state and federal jobs in wildlife. You've been listening to From the Woods Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Okay. 
Okay, before we get back to our main segment, we're going to listen to our wildlife sounds from the forest. And for those of you that might be new listeners to our show, each week we're going to have a, a brief sound bite for a wildlife sounds from the forest. And Dr. Matt Springer will introduce that sound. And then later in the show, we'll hear kind of his explanation of what the animal is and a full, a full description of what that sound is. So let's, let's listen to Dr. Springer. For our segment on wildlife sounds of the forest, we're going to cover this noise here. One that you may hear as you walk out your house every morning and hopefully doesn't cause you problems. We're going to talk about what makes it, why they make it, and what other versions that you could hear in Kentucky for our animals. Welcome back to another edition of From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Renee Williams, along with my co-host, Laura Latka. Today we're talking about black bears with Dr. John Cox, and let's get back to that interview. All right, so you've been talking about your bear research. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of black bears in Kentucky? Uh, Sure. Let me first give you a little bit of background. Uh, The black bear is the smallest, most adaptable, and uniquely North American of the three bear species on our continent. And it's one of only eight bear species worldwide. The grizzly bear and the polar bear are the other two bears in North America, but they also occur in uh, Asia and Europe. In fact, uh, the black bear is more closely related to the, to the Asiatic black bear and sun bear than its other two cousins here in North America. And because it's so adaptable to a variety of habitats and foods, Um, The black bear is not considered a threatened species, uh, but actually its population size numbers about twice as many as all the other seven bear species put together. So the adaptability of the black bear is is really a large part of the story of its recent history and of that uh, of Native Americans and really European history in North America and Kentucky. So Despite inhabiting a continent with millions of Native Americans who hunted them, uh, 400 years ago, black bears were found pretty much throughout most of the U.S., southern Canada, and the forested parts of Mexico. The black bear may have been second really only to the bison in its importance to the Native Americans. And uh, early European explorers, fur traders, archaeologists, and Native peoples describe many examples of using uh, black bears to fulfill their various needs. Black bear fur was uh, used by Native Americans for bedding and for coats and ceremonial wardrobes, for lining uh, the inside of moccasins and as wrappings to protect more delicate hides, such as deer when they transported those to market. Bear fat, uh, often referred to as butter in those days, uh, was used as a shortening to cook with to make candles and uh, bear meat was actually highly prized not only because of its taste but because it required uh, less salt to cure it. So the the bladder of the bear uh, was used kind of like a canteen and used to carry water and oils uh, when they moved around from place to place. And We also see a lot of bear teeth and claws in Native American jewelry and ceremonial wear. So the arrival of early European explorers and fur traders really set into motion centuries of resource exploitation to follow. And even in the mid-1600s, just decades after the Spanish colonized the Americas, you had the beginnings of the fur trade and and increased use of bears to satisfy consumer demands, particularly in Europe. Uh, But bears were seemingly pretty plentiful even when Dr. Thomas Walker came into Kentucky in 1750. And he describes his party harvesting 53 bears along their their brief trek into the state. And soon after that, really, settlers and fur traders uh, followed him into Kentucky, and you started to see a major increase in bear hunting and trapping. 
It's saying between 15 or between 1805, I think, and 07, there were around 8,000 bear hides that were actually floated up the Big Sandy River to market. And eventually, uh, those hides ended up as brigadier's hats, those black fuzzy hats on the heads of the British Army. And the market was so lucrative for bear at the time that Kentucky was, interestingly enough, once known as the Bear State. In that continued hunting and trapping pressure and uh, the introduction of cattle and hogs that gobbled up lots of hard mass like acorns and, and chestnuts that bears used to build fat for winter hibernation, well, that just caused them to decline further. And then I would say that finally, the timber rush in Appalachia between 1880 and 1920, which caused a lot of forest loss, that was probably the final blow to the species. And we think that bears went extinct in Kentucky somewhere around 1900 to 1920, but occasionally you get an isolated report of bears for decades afterwards, but we don't think that there was a viable breeding population there. So bears uh, in Kentucky and in other parts of Appalachia, they were eventually driven into the most rugged areas of Appalachia. And that was primarily the Blue Ridge and Smoky Mountains and other high elevation inaccessible areas. And it was from these refuges from which uh, the bear would stage a comeback. So about that time, you had the, the creation and enforcement of game laws, uh, protection of forests, abandonment of farms that would revert back to forest, and lack of market for bear products. And, and those things combined really allowed the slow growing bear species to recover and eventually spread back throughout Appalachia over the next few decades. But even with that, it wasn't until 1987 that a bear was again captured in Kentucky. In 1996 and 97, uh, though, there were 30 bears that were released on the Kentucky-Tennessee line in the Big South Fork National Recreation Area down in McCreary County. But the public uh, opposed that release and that, that halted the further uh, relocation of bears to that area. Um, 2001, that was the year of the first confirmation of, of bear cubs and that was in Harlan County. And then finally in 2003, uh, we here at UK, we partnered with Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources in what became an 11 year research study and one in which we learned a great deal about bears as they continue expanding into the state. Um, since that time, bears have further increased in number uh, with very limited hunts occurring since 2009. Today, we've probably got up between 500 and 750 bears in the state and they're doing pretty well. Although, uh, globally, bear poaching is still a problem because of the demand for bear products, particularly the gallbladder for medicinal purposes. And you see similar activities uh, of poaching of things like pangolins in Africa and rhino horns and such. And it's all for so-called medical cures, even though there is no evidence that these do anything medically to help people. So uh, unfortunately, we've had some of our radio collared bears poached, and in other cases, uh, that's led to prosecutions and jail for, for those poachers. All right, so we have teddy bears and obviously gummy bears and the story of the three bears and Winnie the Pooh. And so Why do bears play such an important role in our culture? Well, I think from an early age, you know, humans learn to place themselves in the, in the context of and identify with the surrounding world, whether that be uh, in a wilderness or a farm or urban areas. I mean, we recognize many biological similarities and differences between ourselves and in particular those living things that we experience. And that can be directly in person or through uh, oral or written stories that we read or hear, or of course today watch on TV or the internet. Uh, we, we see birds that fly, we, we watch mammals run on all four legs, and animals that are dangerous and those that seem approachable. And it gives us uh, human identity, and it really allows us to categorize things as, as us or them. But uh, we also, you know, we strongly relate to the characteristics of various animals. Uh, we talk about the cleverness of the coyote and courage of a lion and the protectiveness of a mother bear with her cubs. And you see kids all the time during play, they're, they're imitating the behavior of animals, whether that's dinosaurs or birds or mammals. And it's very common to see this emulation in the ceremony of hunter-gatherer uh, cultures. Some Native American tribes consider the black bear to represent uh, the Great Spirit, as the behavior of bear in many ways reflects the seasons. 
I mean, the bear sleeps or hibernates uh, in what might be considered the underworld during the winter, he emerges above ground uh, back to earth in the spring, bringing forth uh, its cubs or new life or, the, or a birth. And the bear lives in abundance of food in the above ground world during the summer, and then it uh, you know, fattens itself up and consumes a lot of food in preparation for the coming winter and the fall, kind of like we do with our agricultural products. And then the bear descends again in the underworld of sleep uh, during hibernation. So you have words like uh, barn and beer, barely, barren, uh, first names like Bernard and Mjorn. Those are all derivatives uh, from the Germanic root word bera. So bears are a very important part of human cultures all over the world where they occur because we share many similarities with them, admire their strength, ferocity, in resilience and can relate to a lot of their behaviors. I mean, just look at our, our sports teams and their mascots. You have the Chicago Bears, Chicago Cubs, and uh, UCLA Bruins. All right, so some people often ask, you know, what good is a bear? Why should I want them here? Well, first and foremost, I, I would say that uh, bears play uh, an extremely important role in our ecosystem. Uh, probably one of the most important is how they act as uh, seed transport trucks. And if you've ever seen a pile of bear droppings, uh, one of the most typical items are seeds, sometimes thousands of them. Uh, so bears uh, might be considered uh, the Johnny Appleseed of the carnivore family, basically moving seeds over maybe dozens of miles and leaving it nicely fertilized with all that organic matter in it. Uh, in Kentucky, uh, in bear droppings, I mean, you see species like uh, blackberry, raspberry, dogwood, viburnum, persimmon, uh, and in places like Florida you would see species like saw palmetto, and those species are getting perpetuated and moved around by bears. Uh, so, you know, in, in tropical forest systems, uh, as much as 90% of the trees there depend on forest animals uh, to spread their seeds away from the mother tree, so it's a pretty critical function. Bears also, as they move around in the woods, tear up a lot of dead wood and they excavate ground which creates habitat for other species like salamanders and, and many insects. And occasionally bears do kill and eat deer fawns or elk calves when coming out of hibernation when they're a little hungrier, but we're really not seeing that in Kentucky just yet. Um, so also clearly bears are important in our enjoyment of nature. Some people still enjoy hunting bears for their meat and fur, but many other people love to see bears, or at least know that they're out there. Uh, it's the highlight of many a vacationer in our national parks to witness a bear. In fact, um, I would say we, we often love them too much. It's uh, common to get bear jams when you have park visitors stop their cars and, and gather around a bear and sometimes creep closer and closer. Uh, and in the older days, people in parks were allowed to feed bears, um, which only encouraged them to associate people with food and risk confrontation. Uh, feeding can also lead to other health problems. Uh, we've captured bears in Kentucky that are in poor health, including uh, very early rotting of their teeth at ages four or five years old. And all of that is really the result of being fed too much sugary human foods. Um, Many of those bears ultimately develop bad habits and they, they get into trouble or got into trouble and some had to be put down because they were too addicted to human foods and they started acting too bold around people. Um, other bears that we monitored, they took risks and they crossed busy roads to try and reach those foods and they were killed by vehicles or even trains. Uh, so basically people should remember that a, that a fed bear is probably going to be a dead bear very soon. Now, if you live in bear country, you should uh, certainly take precautions with pet foods and have bear-proof garbage cans. Uh, if you really care about bears, don't feed them directly or indirectly by not taking care of the foods that's laying around on your property. Uh, but putting things in perspective, there are really very few hum human encounters with black bears that lead to uh, injury or death. It's extremely rare uh, and we should remember that in comparison, there are literally hundreds or, or sometimes thousands of times as many deaths 
from other animal attacks like dogs and collisions with white-tailed deer than with bears. Uh, but with that said, uh, one should remember that you got to keep your best, your distance from bears. I mean, they're, they might look cuddly, but you should never approach them. Uh, never get too close to take a photograph or feed them or, or taunt them in any way. So you've presented us with a great abundance of information, and we thank you for that. So what would be one or two takeaway items that you would like our listeners to leave with? Um, I would say that, you know, in thinking about wildlife and thinking about other environmental issues, um, you know, the growing global human population uh, and the many problems that it creates for wildlife, uh, related ecosystems, and really for us, sometimes can feel overwhelming and a daunting, almost insurmountable set of challenges to kind of overcome. But uh, really compared to just decades ago, uh, in many areas like Kentucky, we were really living in a time of what we might think of as wildlife recovery and growth. Uh, and, the, and the expansion and increased public support of parks uh, and other protected natural areas in many places in the U.S. and around the world for that matter. So uh, I would encourage people to enjoy these wonderful resources, um, but never take them for granted. So there, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to give back and become good stewards of land and its many resources. And I think that's particularly true for private landowners. Um, the, the famous conservationist Aldo Leopold put it this way. He said that the oldest task in human history is to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. So I would encourage listeners to find uh, and do the good and necessary work uh, to sustain our land and wildlife that really we all depend on. Great. Well, thank you, John, for joining us today. And if you'd like more information on what you've heard in this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Um, stay tuned for our wildlife sounds from the forest. We're back once again with uh, Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. And in the studio with us is Dr. Matt Springer. He's an assistant extension professor in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. Thanks for coming in again for us. I'm happy to be here. Okay, so we're going to play that sound again just in case you didn't catch it or you really need to hear it again just to find out what it was. So here it is. Okay, we need to know what was that sound. So that's a tricky one because it's actually uh, multiple different bird species coming out of one bird's mouth, and that's our mockingbird who will uh, repeat other birds' songs for its own song. So how do they know what sounds to mock? How do they know which birds so, to choose from? So yeah, so it's it's uh, they actually learn those songs. Uh, a lot of times it's when they're younger birds, when they're chicks or fledglings, they're learning songs, and all birds learn songs in, in their nest. They hear mom singing and dad singing, and that's where they come up with the songs. Uh, so whatever these birds have around when they're young is really what songs they learn to sing. So is there a certain time that these birds start calling and making these noises and singing? Sure. So the, the big thing why birds sing is, um, and some other animals do this as well, is advertise where their territories are. Where So these uh, male birds in the spring will go around into the corners of their territories and sing as loud as they can uh, to let other female birds know where they are and what they have, and also let other male birds know that this is mine, stay out. So they, they do a lot. It's called, they define their territory by singing. 
So, and then there's other examples of uh, birds you may hear. So we're in central Kentucky and, and we have, you know, you may go out in the spring and um, around your house and you'll hear, uh, so one other bird that's a really loud singer, uh, even though it's very small, is a uh, Carolina wren. And that bird sounds like this. And it's one that is found a lot around houses, and it's doing that for the same reason that the mockingbird that sings, um, and many of our bird species sing. Can you tell what it is by it being so small, or what colors? Well, actually, they have unique songs. Okay. So the, the one thing that the mockingbird does to make it unique is it's not its actual song, but it's its pattern of song. So they'll repeat bird songs, usually in threes. So they'll do something like a, a cardinal call in three, and then they'll switch over to, say, a Carolina wren call in three, and then keep going. So we've heard a little bit about some bird sounds. Do mammals make sounds to kind of define their areas? So mammals uh, usually do something a little different. They don't make as much noise. Uh, they, they rely on olfaction um, a lot of times. And tell us what that is. Define so, that. So olfaction is basically your sense of smell. Okay. So they communicate a lot by senses of smell. So they'll mark their territory. Um, think about your dogs going outside when you let them out, and especially if you have male dogs. Um, that's kind of how they communicate a lot. However, there are some species that do make noise. Uh, a prime example is this one. And that is, you know, a coyote calling and letting other coyotes know where it is, and, and um, they will go around and, and try to communicate via uh, calls. Uh, sometimes people hear them quite a bit at night. I uh, think there are a lot more uh, coyotes than they really are because they do make a lot of noise and sound like more coyotes than, than they actually are. But uh, they do a lot of vocal communicating. Our, our dogs do. So foxes, coyotes, they, they do a lot of vocal communication. What are the coyotes saying when they're communicating? Um, they're I'm talking. A, <laughs> I'm talking, yes. It's all communication. Uh, so a lot of times what they're doing in you know, coyotes or birds is just, uh, here I am, I'm still here, this is still mine. Yeah. So uh, if you want to come challenge me, this is where I am, uh, but I still am here and this is still mine. So if it's, it's, you know, stay out. Mm -hmm. uh, or if, you know, if you're, you know, say a, a girl coyote, you know, you want to come find me and see, uh, you can, here I am too. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you coming again. That was Dr. Matt Springer telling us about some more uh, wildlife sounds from the forest. Tune in next week for our next new sound.